a pleasant morning to our viewing audience and we just want to welcome you to yet another episode of the pastor's corner we pray that your weekend was fabulous we had a high point in our country as we celebrated 48 years of independence and we thank god so much for that privilege i pray that you enjoyed your oil dung and all the you know the national heritage and the you know just a moment to reflect on the goodness of god to our nation Amen. so we want to say welcome um, pleasant morning and indeed you are in for another treat and i pray that our sitting here today would be of benefit to you may motivate you may challenge you so that you can be the best person that god has called you to be amen and as usual i am flanked by two handsome special young gentlemen that have been empowered by god to speak on our topic today and without any further ado i want to welcome to my extreme right Dr. Clinton Lewis, OBE, our dear president, and the one who loves evangelism. And uh, to his right, we have Pastor Enoch Isaac, our ministerial secretary. He is the pastor's pastor, and he also spearheads the men's ministry department. And I want to say a pleasant good morning yeah. to you two gentlemen. Yeah, good morning, good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Pastor, good morning. and good morning to our viewers and listeners. Happy to be here another Pastor's Corner. Amen. So, Doc, how was your weekend? Uh, great, great. Uh, a quiet one. Right. But enjoy the independence. Okay. And um, also enjoy the powerful message Praise that you, you, say, you preached um, to the nation. That opportunity that was given you and um, given to you. I think you really seized the moment. Congratulations. Thank God. Uh, speaking for God. Amen. Pastor Isaac, how about you? How was the weekend? Well, um, working. Um, I, of course, I had my all long. Actually, <laughs> all long both days, <laughs> Sunday and Monday. All right, 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 right. Nice. But of course, yes, I was doing a little gardening. So, um, yeah, that, that was that took over the weekend. But yeah, it was, it was nice. good. Again, thanks. Um, as Doc said, the the sermon um, on, on Sunday evening it was That's quite right. fitting. Amen. Um, you know, quite pointed as well. Yes. Thank Very. you so much for for sharing. Amen. God bless. Amen. Praise yeah. God. Thank you. So, so, Doc, did you do any fishing? Well, you, as you know, one, <laughs> once there's a holiday, I'm gone. <laughs> You're gone. Yeah, so I, I did some fishing and did pretty well, too. Nice. Pretty nice, well, pretty nice, well. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice. So one of our pastors was on the sea and one in the land. <laughs> Praise God for that. All right, this morning, so as we're about to delve into our topic, today we'll be looking at excuses part two. We want to ask God's blessings and his leading as we go forward this morning amen father god we thank you so much for making us free moral beings having the privilege to choose and make choices we pray father that as you have called us and even as you are leading us to a higher plane of living with you we pray that we'll be able to cast aside all excuses so that we can be all that you want us to be amen. grant us that spirit of surrender today i pray for two panelists dr lewis pastor isaac Pray that you would really inspire them to give fitting and ready answers for the questions on hand. And I pray for all those that are viewing online or who would be viewing later on. I pray that whatever aspect of their lives they may be procrastinating or still be using you know, excuses as a crutch. I pray, oh Father, that they will be able to give it up as well. We lift up our technical staff and all the technical aspects, the internet. We pray that everything would work well today for the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So excuses part two. Our first question this morning, is there a connection between procrastination and excuses? What do you think? Okay. Um, I'm happy to be here again. Last week I was part of the team for excuses part one. And as we, we started last week, we gave... We, we gave... Um, I, I, I want to begin by also giving a, a, a definition for an excuse because we're asking if they're connected. Um, you know, an excuse is normally a statement that is given for when something is, is, is not done or something that should have been done and is not done. Amen. We give a, you, know, you give a statement, and that is normally called an excuse. Um, um, procrastination, I, I would say, is is delaying, deliberately, delaying um, a decision or an action that should be taken 
um, put it off for the future um, or some other time, you know, that is procrastination. I think very often the connection, the connection that I see, Pastor Gordon, is that you, one can end up procrastinating, uh, making excuses because of procrastination. So I need to, um, I, I need to, I need to go and do something for someone. And I, I, I have to do it today. At, at, I have to do it for one o'clock. And I say, um, I'm not going to do that. I'll do that at five o'clock. But five o'clock comes and I have other things to do and, and it doesn't get done. But I, I was supposed to do it because the person, I have to, you know, I have to get it ready for the person the next day. So um, at 8 o'clock the following morning, they, they, called, they called me because they know I gave them the assurance that it would be done since 1 o'clock the previous day. But because of procrastination, I put it off. And something else came up, so I couldn't get it done. Then I created an excuse. I give an excuse. But, but so that in that way, there is a connection between excuses and procrastination. Yeah, I see, you know. Um, however, if I, had done, if I had done it the time that I had meant to do it, there was no need to create an excuse, right. you, you know. All so, right. so I'm saying very often, because of um, us not acting at the proper time, procrastinating, then we have to resort to creating or making excuses, which very often are not valid. We, de you know, we, we are use it. You are using it to deflect. You know, the excuse is then to deflect, <laughs> creating excuse, making it sound as though it was. It's a word. Is something we we we, we are saying, not realizing. If we had done it, there was no need to make excuses. So I, I would say that in that sense, that's the connection I see. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I concur. I concur with that. Well, I think it's well said. And um, usually uh, the excuses come because the person doesn't want to do that particular thing also at a particular time. Right. You know, and so to me, what I would add to that is that excuses really, they don't make much sense. Hmm. You know, it's just... It, it, it just it's like you're just throwing something to distract somebody to leave you alone. Leave me alone. Right. But really, um, you know, they really don't make sense. Excuses really don't make sense. They're not genuine. Mm -hmm. It's not a genuine thing. Um, but it is a, a way of escape. Providing myself a way of escape. To me, that I think is reasonable. Mm -hmm. And many times, it doesn't, it doesn't add up at all. Of course, as we said last week, and 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 Doc, that there there are sometimes, um, you know, you excuses. Well, it's an excuse. Mm -hmm. You you um you're on your way. I have to be here to a meeting. I could live well in advance yes. of the time, but major accident on the road. Right. And then I have to call and say I can't come to the pastor's corner because. Um, I have a serious accident. In fact, I'm heading to the hospital. That's an excuse. Yes. But it's not. I'm not deflecting because there's a real there's a real issue here. Yes, yes. But um you know, but we're talking about generally when we have to do certain things, we do do we don't do it, we fail to do it, so we're looking for a way out. Yes. Because we want to look good. You see, mm. <laughs> Pastor God, we always want to look good Correct. in the eyes of everybody. Correct. So excuse is the one <laughs> if we don't give the excuse, we figure people will think of us um, otherwise. So we yes. create an excuse to look good. And that that that's the one we're hitting at. <laughs> that kind of excuse. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just yes or no to the two panelists. Um, there's a very pertinent question. Can an excuse be dishonesty? What do you think? Could it be dishonest with some of the excuses that we pose? Yeah, that, I, I, would have a, I would answer from the back, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because very often I believe many of the excuses are dishonest because yes. you try to, as I said, you, you want to look good. As professionals, you want to look good. You don't want persons to look at you as shabby, not being able to accomplish tasks. So you create an excuse, yes. and then when you when it's accepted, you you think you get away. Some people say, "Well, I get you." Yeah, yeah, because you 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 still look yeah. good in the eyes of the, the person, right? You know, and they don't hold you um because of what you say. Mm -hmm. So, but very often, very dishonest stuff. Yeah. We, we create it. We create it to look good. Yeah, and, and a <laughs> lot of the time, a lot of the times, it's really dishonesty. Yeah. Because sometimes the person really knows. Sometimes even what they, they are saying to you, mm -hmm. it's a lie. Yeah, yeah. It's something that they made up. Yeah. So if if you make up something. You know, then, then it's a lie. For example, Pastor Isaac, I was supposed to meet him for 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I was unable to meet him for 9. Mm -hmm. And I said, boy, what? I, I got to make up something and tell him, man. Mm -hmm. 
So the pastor is like, well, you know, my child was sick and I had to spend a little time oh, with my child. But the child was not sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have mercy. So that's a lie. That's a lie right there. It's this yeah. honesty. Yeah. So and, and a lot of times, people find themselves down that, that road. Mm -hmm. Find themselves down that road. Wonderful. All right. So there are two biblical accounts we want to consider this morning where excuses were presented. And I'm going to just read quickly these two accounts. The first one comes from Luke chapter 14 verses 15 to 20 but i'll read from verse 16 that's where the gist of it begins and it says a certain man made a great supper and bade many to come he sent his servants at supper time to say come for all things are not ready and they all with one consent began to make excuse the first said to him i have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And the other said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. And I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife. And therefore, I cannot come. What is the message that Jesus was trying to convey in this particular passage? We're reading the passage carefully. Um, Jesus, Jesus was very unhappy with them, very annoyed with the, with, with the answers that they gave. True. Because Jesus knew that they were excuses. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, Jesus is trying to make the point very clear. Mm. When we come to the matter of salvation, right. one is called to the kingdom of God. Mm. That takes priority over anything else in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that goes for every, every call of God. Yeah. Anytime God calls me mm. and says to me, this is what I want you to do. Or this is where I want you to go. Hmm. It's just, yes, Lord. <laughs> Anything I come up with um, not to go, right. it's an excuse. Because hmm. when it comes to salvation and the things of God, that takes priority over everything else in my life. True. There's nothing I can tell God for not doing or not going. So when the call was made to come to the kingdom, that takes priority over everything else. Yeah. Seek it first. Mm. First. Not secondarily. <laughs> so when you say I married a wife and I have to go, regardless of what you come up with, yeah. I've just started a big business. Mm. Millions of dollars. So just get, no, all that is excuses. God's call takes priority. <laughs> a hard pill to swallow, but true, Pastor Isaac? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Dr. Lewis 100% there. And, um, you know, the 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 um, all three persons making excuses sounds very polite. Yeah. I pray <laughs> thee, have me excused. Yes. You know, very polite. Yes. It doesn't matter how polite you sound. Jesus was saying, "Hey, they, these excuses are not worthy." Correct. They, no, no, they can't. They can't. They can't stand. No. Um, the last one, a wife. You know, one. You know, one. When normally when someone is married, you you know you get various courtesies that you don't normally get at other times. Correct. But not even then. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. When the call has come for you for salvation, not even the wedding, not even the wife, you know, yeah. um, big business, millions of dollars. You um, do you expect him to throw down this all his money down the drain? Correct. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Salvation takes preeminent. Correct. In our lives, in all our activities. So uh, the message to me. That Jesus was communicating there. I mean, we didn't read the rest of the passages, yes. but Jesus responded. If he had accepted it, he, his attitude would have been different. He Correct. responded by saying, Here what? They don't want to come, leave them out. Correct. Go into the highways and byways mm -hmm. and, and fill this room. Correct. You know, and 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 at the end of it, he said, <clears throat> there'll be whipping and gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. Because there are some who are rejecting the 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 call procrastinating that's right giving excuses sometimes mm. and and thinking that should be good enough jesus should accept that because yeah. he he would think um this is not frivolous you know we can grade the pastor god we can we can grade excuses you know we can say that that that's not frivolous this is a <laughs> wife i just got married jesus mm. must be able to understand that yes that's a serious business activity we've yes. just got a loan from the bank and and the serious money we invest in there jesus have to understand that and jesus is saying no 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 when it comes to salvation the, no excuse must stand. Correct. And I think that's the message that Jesus was trying to convey to his hearers, even today, Amen. to each one of us. Amen. Amen. And there's a very interesting comment from Sister Alicia. She says, the land was not of utmost importance. 
the other one could have been proved could have proved his oxen on his way to the wedding. Correct. And what better thing than to invite your wife to a wedding with you? Mm. Big time excuses. <laughs> very well, very That's well. True. Very true. So we want to go to Exodus chapter 4, um, read 10 to 14. And we're going to look at God's call to Moses. And let's look at his excuse. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servants, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Mm -hmm. The Lord said unto him, Who had made man's mouth? Yes. Or who maketh the dumb, or the mm -hmm. deaf, or the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him who thou wilt send. Yes. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, mm -hmm. Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. What was God uh, trying to convey there? Well, I think similarly um, to what the New, the New Testament passage, Jesus was not accepting any of ex any excuse. I think similarly in the Old Testament passage, here was here was God That's not right. accepting the excuse of Moses. Now, um, as we discussed prior to coming live, that that Moses was indeed it was a fact, you know, um, that Moses was indeed slow of speech. Correct. You know, you would say Moses stammers. You know, yes. you know he was slow of speech, but but. Notice the last verse. God was not happy with Moses. And the reason God was not happy with Moses is because God was the one empowering persons. God is a, is a I mean, he, he is, he's the one who gives speech. He's the one who can alter our speech. I That's mean, right. he's the one who gives sight. He's the one who removes. God is the is a all-powerful one. And here was Moses making an excuse to God as though, you know, you know really. <laughs> I mean, when... You know, I just thought of that. When you when we when you make an excuse to God, it's as though we're telling God you, you don't have the ability to handle the situation. You know? Yeah. So so I cannot speak, and that's what it is. Yeah. Mm. And, so, you know, so <laughs> it just shows that God says, No, I'm not I am God. I can remedy all situations, I can take care of everything. And and it tells me the message is that no excuses that I can come up with. No excuses that anyone can come up with when it comes to God will be acceptable by God. That's right. You know. I believe that um, Moses, Moses really, because he did not want to go, like he forgot his God is speaking to. <laughs> I mean, the one who, ha who has you here, the one who has given you everything that you have, yeah. the God that you, you know, because Moses knows that, that there is nothing impossible for God, that God could accomplish whatever he wants. And I believe that's why God got mad with Moses, because Moses knew he's not somebody who didn't know God. He knew God. And he, he knew the power of God. Mm -hmm. And so here he's telling God, um, yes, and telling God what is the reality. Because it's true, he's, he's slow of speech. He's, he's not a big spokesman. So telling God the truth is good. But he should have said to God, Lord, you know I cannot speak. So, Lord, you have to enable me to be able to speak. That's what he had to tell God. But he uses that now to try to get away from God, get around what God wants him to do. And that's where the excuse comes. And, um, and, and where God um, got mad with him. And, and God has to remind him, you know, you forget who you are talking to. Who gives speech? You know, who gives speech? And I guess then Moses recognized what he was really, really up to, you know. But then God still told him, all right, Aaron, your brother, he's a big spokesman. He'll go along with you. But God knows exactly, you know, he is, um, what he's able to do. In fact, I remember a statement by uh, the prophet Ellen White, where she says, all God's beatings are enabling. Anytime God calls somebody to do something, it's because God is going to enable them to do it. And um, he has all the power um, to do that. Interesting comment says, we can pray and doubt God with the same mouth. That's true. Very contradictory. Very true. Very true. And when God wants to use us, we must allow him to do just that. Many of us are guilty of this. Let's stop looking at what we cannot do 
and what we can and what God can do through us. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Amen. And a latter point there, very important. Fear causes one to make excuses. And of course, perfect love casted yes. out all faith. I just want to add something quickly here. My own example, maybe that sure. might encourage somebody, Pastor. Um, I was an introvert. When I talk about introvert, real introvert, mm -hmm. I don't talk unless I have to. Right through school. Even university, I don't talk. I just sit there. When I became an Adventist, I will sit in the back of the class. If you don't ask me a question, I said no, say nothing. Okay. I mean, know all the answers, but I will say nothing. Mm -hmm. And then God's call come upon my life. I had to go into ministry and look at me today. I think I've surprised my own self. <laughs> you know, what God has done through me. Amen, amen. You know, and sometimes I reflect back on my, my youthful days growing up. And what a serious introvert I was. Even when you put me in a small group, I ain't say nothing. You have to call me and tell me what you think for me to say something. Right, right. But look at me today. I'm ready to talk. Before anything, I'm ready to talk. I think sometimes I talk too much. But that's what God can do Amen. in and through us when we give ourselves to him. All his beatings are enabling. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. So as we move on. There are some popular excuses that, you know, many times we make as people. We want to go through a list of them as we give some pertinent biblical responses to them. And the first one, everyone will be saved. There is no need to accept Christ. So we are saying nobody would be lost. There's no hellfire to destroy the world and the wicked and sinners. But everybody's going to be saved. What is the rush or the need to surrender our lives to Christ? How do we respond to this, men of God? Well, Pastor, you know, like, like <laughs> I suppose all the others, these excuses originate from the pit of hell. <laughs> you see? Because um, how I'll respond to this and the others once we have the time is yeah. to share some comment, but, but really to, to give, relative to give biblical examples of passages of Scripture. For example, I will share two passages of Scripture here. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter into the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and mm -hmm. broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and yes. many there be that go in. Mm -hmm. The Bible didn't say all. No. It said many will go. But here what verse 14 says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be there that find. So many going one way, few going the other way. Everybody is not going to heaven. The Bible <laughs> is clear on that. And then Revelation 22, 14. Mm -hmm. And 15 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and they may enter it through the gates into the city. That's yes. those who um, do the commandments of God. Right? And then verse 15 says, for without, that's who are not, those who are not going to heaven, those who are not, would not be saved, without are dogs and sorcerers and homongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So the Bible is clear. There are some people who are not going to heaven, Pastor yes. God. Correct. So for me to be a preacher, for any preacher to be saying that you don't have to fight up to give your life to Christ. Everybody is going to heaven. That's a lie, Pastor yes. God. The Bible doesn't support that. Yeah, it's a very, 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 very false premise. And, and, there, and interestingly, Pastor, there's a lot of people who believe that. I remember one person who told me that. said, listen, man, you go that way, I'm going that way, and all of us ending up in heaven. Have mercy. But thank God that person came to a crusade that I had. Yeah. And today that person is rejoicing in the same truth I am rejoicing in. Because they get to recognize that that can work. You know, that, that statement, that premise, leaves out the power of choice. All of us are going to get there anyway, no matter what happens. And, um, but Jesus didn't say that. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Jesus says, unless a man be born again, born of the Spirit, born of water, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Cannot. So there's no, the, the power of choice has to be exhibited when it comes to the matter of salvation. One has to come to the point in his or her life where he or she says, God, I'm giving you my life. Take me now. John 3, 16. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth. And, um, and, if, and the Bible also says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So if you don't believe, you don't exhibit your faith in Christ and give your life to him, you just will not make it. As Pastor Isaac says, 
That is a good lie from the pits of hell. That, and so many people believe it. Yeah. We have to help them. So there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. That's well correct. Said. Yes. Now, pastors, we want to go before we take um, just a short promo. We're going to do this final one before the promotion. One of the most popular excuses for persons not wanting to fellowship in church or give their lives to Christ. There are so many hypocrites in church. Why should I even bother to assemble there? <laughs> what would you tell such a person with such an excuse? <laughs> well, um, you know, a number of things could be said, but yeah. I'll say to them that a hypocrite is a false Christian. You know, a, a hypocrite is someone who, who, who uh, is, is giving a false notion of what they claim to be. Correct. Yes? Correct. And we had such persons with Jesus. Exactly. Jesus, you know, Jesus had 12 disciples. I mean, the immediate. And among those 12, he had hypocrites there. <laughs> That's right. But Jesus still went about every day, went about his ministry, and hypocrites are with him, you know. Correct. He's, he went about preaching and teaching and calling persons for the kingdom, and the hypocrites are there. Yes. He's not bothering that. Correct. So, to, so for, as a fall of Christ now, for me to say, well, I'm not bothering, I'm not even bothering to go to the church because they're hypocrites, then I'm, I'm saying, I'm not even following the Bible. Because the Bible is clear. There were persons who were not living up to the standard, and Jesus... You know, at the appointed time, they fell out. Judas was one. Yeah, but Jesus didn't waste a lot of time trying to correct. Ju no, you know, he, he, he was focused on doing what he was doing. Correct. Um, and, and Jesus himself told a parable, Pastor God, um, of the wheat and the tears. Yes. And, and, and Jesus indicated that they should wait until they have it. Correct. The wheat Correct. represents, the, you know, um, the genuine Christian, the tear represents the false or what we call hypocrites. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said they must wait. Correct. Correct. Wait until the time of harvest. Harvest means the time of judgment. Yes. Meaning that church will go on and there shall be genuine persons in church and false persons in church. But church will continue. Correct. Yes. So one shouldn't look inside and say, well, I find there's some false persons that are not coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jesus himself said... Your focus should not be on that. Your focus should be on me. So come in and, and get saved, or, or get saved and, and come in and stay with Jesus. Yes, that's, right. so that, 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 that's my response to that. Well, Ephesians 5 1 says that we must be imitators of Christ. True. And the thing is that, as you rightly said, Pastor, I want to add another element here. Not just Judas, but the leaders of the church, we have people today saying, oh, that is these people inside here are some hypocrites. But in Jesus' day, leaders were hypocrites. Jesus says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Matthew chapter 23. Read through there. So Jesus recognized that there were hypocrites. Some of the leaders of the church, a number of them were hypocrites. Every Sabbath day, Jesus in the temple. Every Sabbath. Sitting down with them, same hypocrites. Yeah. Because in the midst of the hypocrites are also those pastors who are serving God righteously. True. Take for example, when the Bible talks about Mary and Joseph, um, in Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18 down, and how he describes them, righteous before God. You talk about Zacharias and Elizabeth, in Luke chapter 1, 5 to 6. They were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments of God, blameless. And we can go on and on. Anna and Simeon um, in the temple of God, you know, serving God fervently, looking for the, the coming of Messiah. So while in the church, they are the hypocrites, they are also in the church, the genuine ones. And Jesus' example is an example for us. He went right in the church of the hypocrite to show them, to show them the right way. And uh, when people tell me, you know, there are hypocrites in the church, I laugh. I tell them, you think that is news? <laughs> Jesus is there, you had it. And there will always be hypocrites. Yeah. But you come and be like Anna. You come and be like Mary. You come and be like Zacharias and Elizabeth. You come and live the life. Maybe, maybe the Spirit will use you to help those hypocrites to get straight. Yeah. But if you stay outside there, you lost. You lost just like the hypocrites. Yeah. So get inside. Give your life to God. Live your life for God. And um, be an example to those hypocrites. Yeah. And, and also a point to throw in the mix too is that the hypocrites are at the right place at the church. 
Because yes. God loves them. Exactly. And that's the only place he could walk on them so that they can be blameless before his sight as well. So yeah. it's all part of the mix. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Pastor, so far for your contributions. Going pretty well as we look at that topic, excuses part two. And at this time, we want to take just a little break as we look at some promotions for some of the current and upcoming events. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Many persons are looking for the key to a meaningful life. And they've discovered it's not liquor, it's not sex, it's not money, it's not fame, it's not fortune. Yes, the Bible has the answer. It is Jesus Christ who is the hope of the ages. Join me, Glenn O. Samuels, in the Footprints of Hope, Walking with Jesus, evangelistic series, live and in living colors. See you. Welcome back to our dialogue on the Pastor's Corner. And today we have been looking at a very relevant topic that we all have been faced with at one time or the other in our lives. And we are looking at the excuses that we make. Um, so yes. we just want to welcome you back. Thank you for all your contributions. And we are here in studio with our conference president, Dr. Lewis. And of course, our ministerial secretary, Pastor Enoch Isaac, as we continue to discuss. So far, we have been looking at the ex some examples of excuses that people frequently make. And we'll be looking at another such excuse. Excuse number three. I'm still waiting. I don't, I'm not ready to give my life to Christ because I have not enjoyed the world enough. For such a, an excuse, pastors, what would you say? <laughs> Pastor, a lot could be said because, you know, even as I ponder this, I'm waiting until... That means I know I have my life in my hands. That's correct. I have the outlay of it. I mm -hmm. know I can enjoy myself until I'm 25. I'll be in good health. And then at 27, I can accept the Lord. That means I know I can enjoy myself <laughs> until 40. <laughs> and 42, I can accept. If you know something, it means I have full knowledge of all my doings. But that's not so. No. Because we do not know. We only have today. That's true. I, I would love to have tomorrow, but we Correct. don't know. We don't know. So um, that, can be <laughs> that can be a valid excuse. And in, in addition to that, the Bible says in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, love not the world. So the person who thinks of waiting until they enjoy the world, the Bible says love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we are instructed for all that is in the world is a lust of the flesh, 
and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it is not of the Father. And verse 17 says, Pastor God, and the world passeth away, mm -hmm. and the lust thereof, mm -hmm. but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. So we have to be careful. Um, again, we um, procrastination. Yeah. I'm waiting. Yes. I want to enjoy the world. I want to enjoy myself first. Yes. <laughs> but the devil hears that, and the devil wants to take you out before you accept Christ. You see, that's what the devil wants, you know. Yes. The devil wants us to set up ourselves because he knows that we don't have our lives in our hands. And if you should die before you accept Christ, you're lost. That's what the devil wants. Correct. So when, when a young person or anyone says, listen to me, that's not the time yet. Well, number one, I'm going against the Bible because the Bible says today, if you should hear his voice, hard, not, not, not after you please yourself, not after you enjoy yourself, not after you drink, not after you party, not, you know, no, no. Today, if you should hear his voice. So I would say, um, again, that, to that excuse, that's a known excuse. Yeah. And that's a serious excuse, Pastor, because the passage that you use, 1 John 5, 1 John 2, sorry, 15 to 17, when you give serious reflection on that passage, what the person is really doing here is holding on to the temporary in exchange for the permanent. Because eternal life, that is what would stand forever. And the text itself says that at the end. You know, so here is somebody who wants to hold on to that which is temporary at the expense of that which is permanent, you know, and, um, and then making an excuse to continue to hold on to that which is temporary. I mean, that is very, very unwise. And as Pastor said, I want to give two passages on that uh, to help some of our viewers who may need that. Um, for example, Luke chapter 12, 16 to 21. This rich guy who plowed his land and got a rich harvest, he said, ah, oh, soul, take your time, boy. He built all these bands and he said, eat and take it easy, man. You, you have food for years. And then God said, don't fool. Tonight, tonight your soul is, is required of you. So, so here you have it, as Pastor Isaac rightly said. People want to behave as if they know what will happen. They know they're going to live tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to see tomorrow. Nobody has a guarantee on life. And so today, today, that's the moment we have to seize that which is eternal. And when that uh, it comes to our consciousness that uh, God is calling us to give ourselves to him, to seize the moment, to hold on to that which is eternal, that which even death cannot destroy. It goes beyond the grave. Then why should I be so unwise? To make excuses and to push that off while I'm holding on to that which is ten temporary. It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. And uh, Pastor, just a follow-up question. Um, and you know, I think it's one very relevant knowing that we have the campaign going on. There are some persons who genuinely want to make that decision right now. But they know that internally they have not yet been converted or they are, are not at the place instantly right now where God expects them to be, should they get baptized and surrender regardless of the work in progress or should they wait until they have made a firm decision to cut off everything and anything that is unlike God before proceeding? Somebody's at that state. What, what should they do? Well, um, you know, past, well, first of all, <laughs> the, the, um, I'll respond from two points of view. My role as a, as a pastor or a, or a counselor saying to someone, give your life to Christ, even if, um, let, let me, let, someone is in a common relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you need to make a decision. Mm -hmm. I know you, is either you get married or you get out, but I should not tell you that, well, you can't accept Christ today so, because you're in common law. Yeah, I, I know I can't baptize you. Because you, if I baptize you, you must break that. But you have to make the decision. You, you must make the decision to accept Christ. And the Bible says today. But if you can't, that, that's you and God. I must not tell you. Exactly. I must not tell you, you, well, wait until you could get married. No, I don't have the authority to tell you that. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, hard not your heart. But I know if you say, Pastor, I'm ready, I'm doing it today. I will say to you, you okay, so you, you may not go not and live in that um, adulterous relationship or common law relationship. And the person says, no, okay. But, so, so I'm saying the person, individual must know. And, um, and to the question, 
Should I wait? Should someone wait until they fix up? No, you have to come to Jesus as Trust you us, are. Yeah. You, you can't Correct. fix yourself. I can't fix myself. Correct. So for someone may not fully, they may not fully settle in their, in their heart. Well, settle it. All I say settle because remember time is not <laughs> against you. Time is against us. Um, t- time is not with us uh, because um, you don't know what's going on with you on, on the inside. You don't know what the future holds. So you give your life to Christ today. You Correct. accept Christ today. And there are some other things that you don't even know how that will work out. How or some things will work out. You don't know. Correct. But you'll give your life to Christ and, and allow Jesus to work out those other stuff that you're not aware of. Or that you're aware of but you, you don't know how it's going to f- get fixed then. Yes. Than to be saying, listen, I need to fix that first. I need to do this and that. And No, no. Come as you are today, if you shall hear his voice, harden not your heart. Correct. And we have to recognize that God has a million ways that we know nothing of. Mm-hmm. You know, we're thinking in our own little human way, you know, what we have to do, what we have. But God has a million ways of taking care of us, of providing for us. And, you know, so we just have to do what God says. And the point um, Pastor Isaac make must be underlined, um, really, really be emphasized. You know, I've had this situation um, in Grandlands where a couple called me and told me, um, Pastor, we wanted to explain that for us. Because I had a crusade and they were coming there. And they said, uh, we attend a particular congregation. The pastor tells us, we can't marry, no, don't worry. Just come to church and God going to work it out. No, my role as a pastor, that frightens me. So I had to say to them, no, 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 no. No, no, no. God can't work out nothing here. You have heard the voice of God. You know you are living in sin. God says, leave sin now. Right now, not tomorrow. And that is my role as a pastor, as Pastor Isaac rightly says. No, it's up to the individual between them and God. But where my role is as a pastor, I cannot tell in them, well, all right, man, um, you know, well, see how God go work that out. Or uh, maybe, you know, think about it, work hard on it. Work hard on what? What you have to work hard, what you have to work on is give God your life now, right now, because you don't have the next hour. You don't know if you have the next hour. But then, the power of choice. That person now must make their choice what they want to do. But I must tell them what is God's position on that matter. Wonderful responses. We go to the next excuse. I am waiting because of my job. I cannot get the Sabbath off to come and worship and praise God. I really can't make it now. Maybe God will provide a different job for me later on. Probably after I speak with the supervisor, he may understand a bit. But I have bills to pay. I have a family to feed. I have needs to take care of. I cannot give my life now because God calls me to keep his Sabbath day. Um, but I can't. Things are mm. tough and tied up for me. How would you respond to such a matter? Again, Pastor, of course, you, you mentioned um, something there. And the, those practical things should be explored. Yes. Um, you, have, you have a job. And the Sabbath truth is presented to you. I would not say as a pastor, just walk out and I would say you approach your boss. Yes. So, you know, you're doing what you could do. Exactly. And, and say to my, your boss that, you know, um, you know, in a meeting that I have now found Jesus and, and, um, and his requirement that I should, I believe that I should obey his Sabbath. I would therefore um, like to be rescheduled so I do not have to work on the Lord's Sabbath anymore. You know, so you approach your boss and, and let you, you can get an answer. Okay, sure. You, or you may get an answer. No, we, we can't accommodate that. No, if, if you get an answer, sure, we'll do that. Then no problem. You proceed to um, give your life to Christ knowing that your boss have understood your situation. Yes. Now, the other could be that the boss is not recognizing that. It's Sabbath. You got to work on Sabbath. If you, if you want a job, you have to work on Sabbath. No, you have to decide that. The boss is saying, you have to work on Sabbath. No, you have to decide that, right? And if it comes to that, who you, who would you um, go along with? Go along with your boss and hold the job or go along to and obey the will of God? And that's where the tough thing comes in, Pastor God. And um, I would say to that person, hey, um, like David said in the, in, in the psalmist, David said, you know, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Um, you have to believe that. I know some of, even some of our members, some of our uh, members, some of you, my viewers, um, take the stand well. Um, you know, I, I had a person say that to me, Pastor, you, you know, would the church help you feed your children? You know, uh, as though 
um, they were saying, if nothing else, you may have to ignore God's Sabbath. Yes. You know? Um, but we should never take that view, um, Pastor, because God is, is, is the originator. God is the, I mean, God is the superintendent of our lives. And if God calls you to do something, you, you, I cannot say your, your children may not, you, you may, your children may miss a meal. But, I, I, you know, God, God would not allow them to die from hunger. That's he will true. find someone else to feed them. Very and and you may ha- I wouldn't say, okay, so you leave your job today and next week you get a job. No, God might put you through a tough time, maybe three months, you, yes. and you have to get people to feed you and what have you, what have you. Yes. But, but David is, I believe the word of David, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Two never. Words. You know what forsaken never. means? Be completely left alone, nothing. And uh, in my life, um, like David, I can say I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Correct. That doesn't mean that when you give up, you immediately you, you give up the job today and next Friday, by next Friday you're walking. It may not be that way. It may be that way. Or you um um you know, you you just have all the stuff you need. No, God may put you to your test. But God always comes out on top. Yeah. You know? I will also point up also to the promises of God because God's promises are yeah, yeah. And God says in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 to 30, that if you have to leave anything, eventually it may come to the point where a person may have to leave that job. But if you have to do that, the promises of God are there. God says, if you have to leave anything or give up anyone for me, God says, I'm giving you a hundredfold in this life. Hmm. Pastor Jimmy, I don't know no um, bank right now. That will give you 10% interest on your saving. If you find one, tell me. 10 Ella. Because I hear in 1%, 2%. They don't give well, you 3 and 4 You get 3 and 4% again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So God is not saying I'm going to give you 10%, 20%, 30%. God says, man, if you make those decisions for my sake and the gospel, I'm giving you 100%, 100 fold in this life. Yeah. And then he adds the other part now. And eternal life in the next mm-hmm. hallelujah so what is this thing about giving up anything for god man anything you have to give up for god just walk by faith god takes care of you so we have the old testament testimony yeah. we have the new testament testimony and god is true to his word amen, amen. well said pastors thank you so much um as we come down another excuse I really cannot leave the church where I am at the moment. I'm the leader of different departments. I have so much responsibility. Um, probably the pastor or the priest expects so much of me. I cannot leave now. The church needs me. What would you tell such a person? <laughs> well, pastor, this thing about salvation is not about church. No. No, I'm, I'm saying that it's not about church. It's about Jesus and, and acceptance of, of Jesus' word. Relative to what his word requires of us. Correct. So it should never be about church. It's all about Jesus. Yes. And if Jesus calls you, of course, Jesus has a church. But Jesus will direct you to his church. So he sh- one shouldn't be saying, I shouldn't leave my church. What about church is that? It's about if Jesus calls you, he will put you where, he, where you should be. Amen. Yes? And, and besides that, the, the, the wise man Solomon says in Proverbs 4.18, I think it is, um, the part of the just is like a shining light. Correct. So, yes, you, know, you belong to a congregation. You have been exposed to that. That's what you know. But then God reveals certain light to you. Then you follow the light. The Amen. part of the just is like a shining light. So, I should not be, one should not be holding on to my church. I was placed there. That's what I knew I'm holding on to. The, no. When light is revealed, I must be willing to follow light, wherever that light. Once it's, once it's God's light. And God exactly. will not lead, you, lead us in, in, in folly. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so, I, I'm saying we, 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 we can't accept that. And, of course... Um, the Apostle Paul, um, um, Peter said in, in Acts 17.30 that at the time of ignorance, God wink. Yes. So you're worshipping a particular place, you're holding on to that. No problem. You are, that's what you knew and God wink. Meaning he, you're, not, you're not in a state of rebellion. You're yes. worshipping God based upon your knowledge. But after you came to a knowledge of what is right, exactly. if you continue, that is rebellion. Correct. And, and that's the problem. Correct. No, you are living in sin. Let me give you a quick example of people who you have to be genuine. You see, as Pastor Isaac says about you and God, I had a crusade in Tiche in Trinidad. And um, one night a young lady called me. She said, Pastor, 
I saw a big man crying and going home last night. I saw you mean. She said, he's crying, he's crying. I said, describe him. So she described the person. I recognized who the person was. So I said, my Bible walker, go and check this guy. When they went, and they told the guy, we heard that you were crying last night. He said, yes. He said, all my life I've been addicted in this church. He said, I've been loyal to my, to, 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 to my post. Only to come and hear that I've been living in disobedience, open disobedience to the commandments of God. When in the very church, the Ten Commandments, I hung up there. And I disobeyed the Sabbath. And that man was in tears. And he got baptized. So people who are honest yeah. about God, as Pastor Isaac said, is about God. It's about you and Jesus. And when Jesus calls you, you follow what he says, regardless of where you are. Wheresoever he leads, you follow. That is a Christian. He's a follower of Christ. Powerful responses. Thank you, pastors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two more. Um, my wife or my husband or my partner does not want me to make such a decision. And many times we see that happening. Mm -hmm. A husband may be standing in a wife's way or a wife in the way of a husband, or a boyfriend in the way of a girlfriend, girlfriend in the way of a boyfriend, or even parent in the way of a child, or child in the way of a parent. Um, how would we counteract or counsel someone who finds themselves in such a quandary? Well, <laughs> it, it, as I, um, you know, as I said earlier, in matters of salvation, Pastor God, every man to his own, you know, we... We teach as a church and, and, and you know, um, the connection uh, that a husband must have with his wife, you know, um, for good family relations. That's right. You know, and um, we teach that. We, you know, there must be cooperation. Correct. But when it comes to the acceptance of, of God's word, when it comes to salvation, it, it's folly for a husband to say, I can't do it, my wife is not ready. Correct. If you understand what I'm saying. Yes. Other matters you you disc uh, yes, of course, a husband or a wife should say, honey, I'm 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 giving my life to Christ. Discuss it. But not to get the permission. True. It's not a business activity that you want, you know. It's you and Jesus alone. Very true. So when it comes to salvation, in matters of salvation, it's 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 every man to his own. The the, the child has to make that decision. The husband must make that decision. The wife must make that decision. I mean, um, Pastor Gordon, we even before using a text, I, I, you know, as a, as a young, ch as a child growing up, I remember my father um, preaching and 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 um, you know, in various crusades and and those open meetings and and there was a gentleman who, who what we call planners his step, saying to his wife, she should never give her life to Christ. If she gives her life to Christ, and the cutlass he would be, when she comes back, he chopping her up. Now, you know, as a, as a child, eight, um, nine, ten, I remember that. And, and that lady never gave her life to Christ. Lady died, grown now as a young man. That man, I never forget that. That man, lady is dead and gone long, and now he's a grown elderly man. And the gospel has come to him. That same man accepts Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. Every time I think of that, I, I, I wonder what's going to happen. True. This man is now the same thing he, he, he was promising to chop up his wife for. No, she's gone. Years, long years later, he has now accepted Christ, yeah. rejoicing in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if that lady, God knows the heart, but if that lady never really accepted, well, as far as we know, she never accepted, but rise up in the judgment and seen her husband, the husband who stopped her, is now mm. ascending into heaven. Yes. If you understand what I'm saying, this is yes. serious. When the word of God comes to you, you have to accept it. Correct. When the word of God, whatever the, the circumstance, you, you need to accept it, Dr. Amen. Lewis. Amen. Accept it and Amen. stay with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah. I concur. Yes. I concur. Well said. And we have a response from Sister Gabriel. They also spend time on your knees. God yes. can move things to the side. Mm -hmm. So you can go forward with the decision to follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, and, and just to say, um, our time is almost gone, but just to say... Um, People should live with the expectation, as the Bible says, a man's foe is expected to be in his own house. Exactly. There's a possibility. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So live yeah. with that possibility that your your enemy relative to could be in your own house relative to um when he issues a salvation. Yes. So he doesn't have to come from outside. So if you live with that expectation, then it could mean your you could know that my wife 
my, my son, my daughter, my, my, my husband could, could oppose me mm-hmm. even within the, my house. That's right. <laughs> because Jesus said so. That's correct. Matthew 10, 36 yes. and 37. That's right. All right. We have room for one more question. Songs genuine, but another excuse. Hmm. How can the majority be wrong? And we might be preaching to someone, come out of the world, but the majority of people are in the world. Um, come, come out and you know, be in that group that have been surrendered to Christ. And somebody may be wondering, well, all these people in the world, will they be lost in truth? The majority can never be wrong. Well, that, <laughs> that premise is also wrong. Mm. In, in the area of politics, yes. Um, it's votes that count. Mm-hmm. So who gets the most votes? They, they, they win. But in the area of morality, when you go yeah. back, look, let's, go, let's quickly run through the Bible. Um, right, you go from Genesis to Revelation and recognize when it comes to obedience to God and morality, the majority are always wrong. Hmm. Let's go with Noah. Yeah. Yeah. They're wrong. The Tower of Babel. They're wrong. So the majority is always at the crucifixion of Christ. They're wrong. You know, the majority, when it comes to morality, the majority is not there. And our text, Matthew 7, 13 to 14. You know, Jesus says, straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leadeth to life. Few, there be that found it. But why is the gate of those who, 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 who are lost? And that's where the majority are. So the, when it comes to that issue of morality and uh, obedience to God, the majority has never been right. And so the issue here is not numbers, yeah. but the issue is obedience to what God says. And that settles it. Yes, and um, j- just to add, um, Noah mm-hmm. and his household was in minority. Yes. They, and they were right. The majority was wrong. Correct. Lot. Sodom. Yeah, yes. he to have Sodom on his, well, his da- two daughters and exactly. wife initially. They were in the right. The majority was wrong. Correct. So, um, yeah, if <laughs> when, we, when we look at, as Dr. Lewis said, salvation, salvation issues, morality, you cannot go with the majority. No. No, no. No. We, we've seen it. I think we, we, we gen- even in practical life situation, um, you know, we, we see very often because the majority sometimes don't think. You just That's go right. along, like exactly. Buffalo mentality. Exactly. You, just, you just go along. You join a crowd. You're not even quite sure what's Correct. happening. You just go along. Just go along. Um, very often, when you sit back and think, then you, you come to the point, hey, that, that's the right decision to make. True. So, um, and the Bible is clear. The majority is not right when it comes to salvation. Correct. Yes. The Correct. majority of the persons that come to the Bible will be lost. Yes. Is it? That's of correct. course, many persons will go to heaven. You yes. Know? But the majority will reject Jesus Christ. Correct. Yes. Very so um, correct. We, that, 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 that's not a, a valid excuse for not accepting Christ. Today, if you shall hear his voice, if you're out there and you're one of our visitors, uh, one of our friends, and you need to give your life to Christ, please give your life to Christ. Today, Amen. Today Amen. is the day of salvation. Amen. 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 Brother David, as we wrap up, I do agree that you should decide for God. He will stand for you. That's I am right. speaking from experience. Amen. So there we have a Amen. testimony. And Amen. we just want to encourage all those of us, starting with us as the pastors, you as the online viewers, and even friends or family that you may hold you know, dearly to your heart. No excuse is too big. No problem insurmountable. But as long as we tap into God's power, he can give us the strength to break from all excuses as we decide daily for him. Father God, thank you so much again for the freedom of choice. Despite the obstacles and the excuses that we are tempted to make, I pray, O God, that all of us will be able to say, like Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen.